guys, it's ASPYT and this is the Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra. It's Samsung's most premium, most expensive device in the range this year. You may have seen unboxing and very limited first impression videos, um, but I've been using it on and off for the last week or so and I wanted to delve a little bit deeper because there's, there's a lot to talk about. And for reasons we'll get to in a second, this is possibly the most iPhone, Android phone you can buy right now. Let me explain. Excuse me. Firstly, before we get to that, let's smash up the like button if you are hyped for the S21 series or just for 2021 smartphones in general. And thanks to Otterbox for sponsoring today's video. So Samsung dropped their latest Galaxy S21 phones just a few days ago, consisting of the expected three different models, the S21, S21 Plus and the aforementioned S21 Ultra. I will have videos coming on both those other two models very, very soon. But right now, today, we're talking about the, uh, the big mama. The head honcho, the big cheese, the, uh, yeah, the S21 Ultra. Did I just refer to the S21 Ultra as the big cheese and the head honcho? Now, personally, I have no brand allegiance or brand loyalty when it comes to tech and smartphones. If I like the product, I like it, regardless of the brand. And this runs through to choosing a phone as my daily driver. Hate that term, but you get the idea. I use iPhones and Android phones all the time, daily. For different reasons, they both have their advantages. So currently I'm choosing the best from Apple, the 12 Pro, in my opinion, subjectively the best, for reasons I touched on in my iPhone 12 series videos, and the best from Android, again, currently right now, the S21 Ultra. I know a lot of people are hyped about the Xiaomi Mi 11, but currently I haven't got hands on with that, so I'm not gonna pass judgment until I do. So for me, right now, it's this bad boy. And in using these two phones, I've, noticed of course the obvious differences but also surprisingly the amount of similarities as you'll see in a minute so up front we have a huge 6.8 inch quad hd plus dynamic amoled two times infinity o display it's got a resolution of 3200 by 1440 it's hdr 10 plus certified with a ppi density of 515 and it's classic samsung it's gorgeous they really are the pinnacle of display technology in smartphones. 40 megapixel selfie camera in the center, more on cameras later, and there is a new Qualcomm fingerprint scanner that's bigger and so far does seem much quicker and more reliable, which is nice as I felt the scanner on the previous gen, S20 Ultra, was a bit meh. You have a new eye comfort shield feature which helps to reduce eye strain and fatigue as the blue light filter can be automatically adjusted as can the adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate meaning the rate can go from the maximum 120 hertz right down to just 10 depending on what you're doing with your phone and the status of the battery etc this in theory will be a big win in the battery department, as will the new five nanometer chipset. Now I noticed on the S21 Ultra from last year, if you were living in the US or China and had the Qualcomm chipset, you were living in battery heaven compared to us mere mortals who live in Europe, for example, or any region that use Samsung's own in-house Exynos chip. But this time around with the S21 series, it seems closer. The Exynos 2100 here seems to have gone some way to bridging that gap with early indicators showing the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 provides about 15% better power and battery efficiency than last year's Snapdragon 865, decent of course, but with the Exynos 2100, it's between 30 and 35% better optimized than the Exynos 990 from last year. Now, without going into full details prior to the second embargo lift, I have noticed that I've been mildly impressed with the battery performance um, using this Exynos chip but I'll let you know more very soon. And if you'd like to see it, I will also get hold of the Snapdragon version and do some battery performance tests, etc. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that. If we flip to the back, we have a really nice matte finish, similar to the Note 20 Ultra, and therefore contrasting with last year's S20 Ultra, which was glossy and in the case of the reviewers units anyway, a pretty yucky gray. I wasn't a massive fan of that, if I'm being completely honest. I would probably choose the silver one to the black one, if given the choice. Um, but if it's matte black, I'm more on board than if it was glossy. Now we also have what Samsung call a contour cut camera design, where the camera bump bleeds over the metal sides, giving it a more unibody free flowing feeling, even if the bump is still there, as is table wobble. Cases will generally prevent this, of course. The camera array on the black model anyway, kind of reminds me of a spider, 
cue the memes. But if you don't have arachnophobia and you can handle that look, is the quad camera setup a significant upgrade? Well, yes and no. Firstly, let's look at exactly what we have here. So we're looking at a second gen 108 megapixel primary sensor, which may not seem new to Samsung fans in terms of high megapixels, but it is now capable of capturing 12 bit HDR photos with colors that are 64 times richer. We have a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle with dual pixel autofocus and a 120 degree field of view. And we have two telephoto lenses completing the setup. And how this works is that anytime you zoom up to 10 times, it uses the three times optical zoom lens and anything after 10 times zoom, it uses a 10 times periscope lens. Now, while the 100 times max zoom is still not the highest quality, as obviously anything after 10 times is still digitally enhanced, it does seem in early testing much easier to use, being smoother and more stable between the ranges. It feels just that little bit more refined than uh, last year's offering. And if you want to take your photography game to the next level, there is a 12-bit raw file option for you pros out there. Like you. You are a professional. Don't let anybody tell you you're not. There have also been a few other tweaks here and there, like improvements to autofocus, which was a buggy experience to say the least on the S20 Ultra, enhanced low light photography with a new faster, brighter night sensor, and a vlogging feature, which allows you to record using the front 40 megapixel sensor and the rear cameras at the same time to a max of 4K at 60 frames a second. There is also 8K availability and a director's view video feature where you can preview and switch between different lenses when recording footage, which is a pretty great addition, especially for those budding content creators out there. One potential downside in the camera department with the S21 Ultra is, again, in early testing, photos sometimes come out a little bit on the soft side. This is nothing new. We've seen this with a lot of Samsung phones before, especially when we're talking about portrait shots compared to the likes of the Google Pixel, etc. And certain outlines, for example, don't come out quite as crisp. I've said time and time again, I would prefer to see Samsung go more into looking at image processing and the software behind it so that they can really make the most and utilize the brilliant camera hardware that undoubtedly they put in these phones. Better software would help Samsung realize the potential of their cameras more. That was a very long-winded way of saying, maybe look at improving the camera software to go with the hardware. <laughs> the rest of the phone is where things get a little bit more interesting, a little bit strange, a little bit more confusing, and the lines between Samsung and Apple become a little bit blurred. Hear me out. And if you're enjoying this video so far, a sub would be awesome. So the first interesting slash strange move with this phone is the fact that there is S Pen support. A weird one for me. It's basically like using a Samsung Note phone, but not as good. The pen itself is an additional extra. Where have we seen that before? And it doesn't have as much functionality as the Note line. It also doesn't fit inside the phone like it does on the Note line. Instead, you have to use a specifically designed case to house it in. And overall, in my opinion, there's only two possible ways or two possible reasons why Samsung have decided to include this feature. Number one, profit. Additional extras are the bread and butter of creating uh, more profit in this area of the market. And number two, if they're going to drop the Note series. There's no doubt about it, the S and Note series phones have been merging towards the middle. And in fact, and I mentioned this in my Note 20 Ultra review, a lot of people now refer to the Note as a Galaxy S with a pen. Will there be a Note 20 Ultra this year? Probably. Will there be one after that? Maybe not. And then, of course, the rest of the phone is classic Samsung. Or is it? So Apple tossed out the headphone jack a few years ago. Samsung mocked and then followed suit. Then, this year, Apple tossed out the charger. Certain Samsung outlets mocked. And then, as you can see with the S21 series, they followed too. And the final mirroring in this pattern, and perhaps the most disappointing of all for many Samsung fans, the dropping of the micro SD card slot, something iPhones have never really had. Yes, there is ample RAM and storage options, 16 and 512 gigabytes respectively, but not having that expandable storage option means if you want to go more, you have to pay for it. This will make Samsung more profit and it'll cost you more. You see where I'm going with this. And then, of course, you have the conveniently named Galaxy Buds Pro, AirPods Pro. As Samsung continued to improve their ecosystem, I'll let you guys decide on which ecosystem is the best. But all of this, in my opinion, leads to a new direction from Samsung. 
for the longest time, the majority of the consumer market, not techies, but the sort of average person on the street, if they don't buy an iPhone, the chances are they would say, oh right, so I buy a Samsung phone then, yeah? Certainly in the Western world anyway. And yes, a lot of that global widespread adoption of Samsung phones is down to heavy and expensive marketing, but also because they've always been huge leaders in innovation and not cheap, but you get more spec for your money than you do with an iPhone. And in throwing the big numbers, the full features, the bells and whistles, it would be a stark contrast to, again, what you'd get with an iPhone. And while the S21 Ultra certainly does have elements that are industry leading, bleeding edge, feature rich, it also, as you've seen, follows certain plays made by Apple in recent times, leaving it in a kind of weird in-between Android iPhone vortex. I think due to the huge rise in the quality of other Android phones, OnePlus, Xiaomi, Huawei, Google ban aside, they're getting so good that now the average consumer is now becoming more open to the idea of if they don't get an iPhone, they could get a Samsung phone, but they could get one of the others. So Samsung are now blending in more in the Android crowd than massively standing out like they once were. To cut a long story short, it seems in my opinion anyway, that Samsung are losing their grip a little bit on being the only real alternative to the iPhone. And because of that, they're looking to regain some initiative by shifting their strategy and focusing more on maximizing profit, something Apple get accused of a lot, and making their flagships appeal more to the non-tech heads and more of the average consumers, traditional iPhone users, if you will, and being less of a polar opposite than they once were. Now, I'm not saying for any minute this is a straight copy of an iPhone or that it is indeed better or worse or the same as an iPhone because that's a hugely loaded statement. It's incredibly subjective. But what I am saying is over the last few years, Samsung, it seems, have definitely been trying to target some of the premium iPhone market and have been almost mirroring market launch styles and profit attempts. But irrespective of all of that, the S21 Ultra is still an excellent, excellent phone. And I will be switching my SIM card out of the 12 Pro into the S21 Ultra, a lot of numbers, and I'll be using it on and off for the next period. And I will, of course, as I said, be going more in depth in my next reviews, comparisons, etc. once I've gone full SIM only. And that is a perfect segue into today's video sponsor, Otterbox. Otterbox are famed for providing popular smartphone case protection, but they are now developing accessories for next-gen gaming as well. I just got an early sneak peek of their brand new accessory portfolio, and it looks fresh. Not only have they created new mobile gaming accessories, but also ones specifically for Xbox controllers. Now you are getting the inside scoop here because these are not yet available, but stay tuned to the channel because I will be showcasing some of them very, very imminently right here. If you'd like to see that, make sure you are, of course, subscribed to the channel. Drop a like on the video if you enjoyed it and found it helpful. And also if you didn't like the video or hated it, drop a like on the video. It works the same for me. I think. I love you and leave you. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.